Spyro the Dragon and Why I'm Still a Virgin today on... I feel like we should start <laughs> doing those uh, two titles. <laughs> yeah, the like, serious uh, and then the yeah. ridiculous. Okay. Everybody, hello and welcome to Press B to Cancel. My name is Guy Prime, here today with my, my good friends and werewolf to discuss Spyro the Dragon. I'm kidding. I love you the most, werewolf. Oh, that hurt. I'm sorry. I meant Paul. Then that hurt. Hey. Also, Jake. Look, I love I you all that. equally, Thank just you. in different ways. <laughs> what was that? You say mom? <laughs> I thought we were doing really good with this intro, too. Here, let's do it again. No, we'll just, you know what? We'll, we'll, we'll keep it. <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you what. Okay. Before we get <laughs> so, which one's the sexy stepsister? <laughs> what website are you looking at? No, that would be no. Jake. <laughs> okay, so back. Uh, Wikipedia, sure. apparently, a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you have Wikipedia pulled up under an incognito window? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the foot one. It's Wikipedia. Oh, it really is this decade's uh, National Degree of Havoc. <laughs> this is gonna be a, this is gonna be a great episode, yeah. So today I'm press B right. to cancel. Uh, Welcome. Should we everybody. keep going or should we start over? I can start let's, over. Let's okay. keep going. No, keep well, going. before we get too far into <laughs> stop the episode, now. let's uh, let's go around uh, and and say who we are. Who's with me today? Let's start with Werewolf. Here. And uh, sick Jake. <laughs> Present. There's always one in every crowd, you know. And Pulse 109. I don't remember the class election. You don't remember what? <laughs> the class election. Yeah. No, that's what we'd say instead of president. We'd be like president. How did you guys ever get anything we done with that level of kids. creativity? <laughs> yeah. So I'm today sorry. I wanted to talk to you guys uh, about Spyro the Dragon. Have you guys played this game? No. Oh, crap. I have not. Uh. <laughs> I feel like it's the only PlayStation game wow. that I didn't play. Uh, I, I may have just had a revelation. I will discuss that here in a bit. But how about you, Werewolf? Have you played it? Yeah, I actually played through the original way back when on PlayStation. And then I played the remake when it first hit PS4. Okay. Okay. So we'll we'll get to all that because there's quite a few Spyro titles. I guess it's kind of like saying, hey, have you ever played Mario Brothers? Because then everybody's like, well, yeah, this one or this one, or if you're Pulse, just flat out no. But uh, the original <laughs> came out, I believe it was September of 98. <laughs> Don't you confuse me with Zelda again. Yeah, no, we're, we're doing, no, we're going to cover all of Spyrodom, uh, Spyrometry, yes, the study of Spyro. Ah. <laughs> Is that Canadian Spyrography? Spyrometry. <laughs> no, it's world. World Spy Robins. Good. Okay, so. I'm shutting up now. 98, there's like this brilliant window <laughs> of time for the PlayStation 1, and it basically was in 1998, where, for me at least, this is a golden age after the NES, where you got Spyro, you got Metal Gear Solid, and Final Fantasy VII. Like, 97, 98 was just the tits for PlayStation 1, and it was great. So, I had this friend named Chris. I was in seventh grade, and he had a PlayStation 1 before I did. And we used to go over there, and he had that demo disc, and Spyro was on it. The revelation I thought I had was because I used to kick ass at Spyro. I, I could just fly through that game. I don't remember the demo disc until you had said that, Jake. And now I'm thinking, maybe I've never beaten Spyro. I just beat the fuck out of that demo disc. Because I, I just got done redoing the, uh, the first playthrough <laughs> of the remake, and there's a lot of stuff I didn't remember. <laughs> so that makes more sense. <laughs> Your childhood pride is probably based on beating two levels on a demo disc. Uh, but no, anyway, so I, I absolutely love this game. This is, um, for me, it was before Final Fantasy uh, and Final Fantasy VII and after Metal Gear Solid. So I'm just setting the scene for you guys and then I'll, I'll get to your stories because I want to hear them. But I had come away from all of the, the, at the time, gorgeous graphics of Metal Gear Solid, but all the twists and turns that come with any Hideo Kojima game, but that one was really just explosive for me and, and what was possible with video game storytelling. So then we switched gears. No, it, no, no, no. Wait, Spyro was Hideo <laughs> uh, Kojima? Metal Gear. Holy shit. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. That's what so I I'm took probably out of this. not telling. Okay. 
I'm probably speaking over myself too much, but. No, I'm just, I'm okay. hearing what I want to okay. hear. You are an awesome <laughs> and thorough lover, Polsh. <laughs> I, got what I, need. Well, okay. I got what I needed, so, um, so you guys can do the rest of the episode. We switch gears and we go to Spyro, which I wanted to just keep playing through Metal Gear because it had so many great replay values, you know, um, with the different suits and all that kind of stuff. But Chris convinced me that, hey, we should try Spyro. Um, and we, we, you know, we, we plugged it in. And now I'm in my head debating, was it the, the demo disc or was it the actual game? But it, it had to have been the actual game. Because I sucked at it way too long for it to not be. Uh, but no, right away, um, it sucked me in, giggity, in a way that very few games ever have. And the only game that's really done it since, if I'm being 100% honest, was Metroid Prime. Uh, so no, right away, Spyro, incredibly addictive, beautiful game, great soundtrack, um, which, again, we'll talk about later. But that was my experience with Spyro. Uh, Paul, what was your first... Ex- uh, no, uh, Jake, what was your first experience with Spyro? <laughs> yes sorry something's going on with my computer like the screens keep dying and when i pull it back up uh audacity has quit recording so I, I I, to... hold on i'm stunned because you just there's that did you just compare spyro with metroid prime <laughs> <laughs> yes it's not that i i compared spyro to metroid prime in that oh these are the same game but uh they both had some sort of mystical magical quality <laughs> that pulled me in and i was immediately addicted to it that's okay. <laughs> well, they are different games, but that that one thing they had in common, in my experience. Oh, see, like I just they seemed so different to me. Spoiler I, alert: okay, Spyro so... was a girl the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'm trying to be an <laughs> asshole. I, I, it's it's not me. It's the gummy bears. I'm telling you, they 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 bring out the worst of me. Reignited my heart. Okay. So, I, yeah, I played that demo dish. I, dish. My friend had the PlayStation. I got the N64 and, like, three games. And I was always jealous of my friend because, like you said, PlayStation was the winner of that console generation. And games like Metal Gear, Final Fantasy definitely sealed it for me. And I had Mario 64, which was fun, but it wasn't all that great to me. So then, you know, when I saw Spyro on the demo disc, we tried it. Oh, my immediate impression was shots that it was even fire. worse than Mario sixty four. I did not like for it, like like it at all. Like I found the graphics nowhere near as good as Mario. I found the music forgettable, and you just run around collecting gems, right? I didn't really give it much of a chance. And to be fair, the demo disc, I can't remember how many levels were on it, but it was super short. So it wasn't much exposure to the game. And out of everything on the PlayStation, Spyro is one where I'm like, eh. And I just never gave another thought. And I saw gameplay over the years of the sequels, and our views were always good, I think, of the series. But it was just never something I tried or cared for when I was uh, that age. So it really wasn't until the remake that I came on board with Spyro. And I think it's the remake is amazing, but we can get to that later. Well, no, I mean, it's it's okay. We can mention that um, Spyro did get a remake called the Reignited Trilogy. Um, as I kind of alluded to at the top of the, the cast, there is at least a dozen Spyro games, I would imagine, across every platform from the PlayStation 1 to the PlayStation 4 and a lot of offshoots in between. Uh, so the Reignited Trilogy, trilogy, obviously just the first three, remastered, um, better graphics, updated music, um, Better rendered, et cetera, et cetera. So that's that, when we talk about the remake. That's what we're talking about. Uh, so let's go on over to Mr. Werewolf. How about you, sir? What's your your Spyro experience? I'm gonna guess it was 2002 or 2003 because I don't think nope. I played through them until after <laughs> Spyro 2 <laughs> dropped on GBA. You know, the Season of Ice, Season of Flame, or whatever. That's Game of Thrones. That's exactly what I'm thinking. Damn it. J.R.R. Martin presents Well, Spyro. I mean, you know how GBA games at the time, they all had to have two different versions. <laughs> right. And Spyro was no exception. There was Spyro 2 Season of Ice and Spyro 2 Season of Flame, I think they were called. Oh, no. Really? They did a Pokemon Red Blue thing? I mean, it was it was a Spyro game. It probably, I want to say it played kind of like Sonic 3D Blast, but 
I didn't play that one. My brother played it. He was really into Spyro, so he had the trilogy. He had the GBA <laughs> game. Wow. And <laughs> I had already gone through the, the Crash trilogy recently, so I was like, well, I'll go through the Spyro trilogy too. This should be fun, you know? So I started digging into the Spyro trilogy. I th- I don't remember if I played through the first two or all three of them, but I did play through at least two of them back then, and I loved what I played. Um, I think I was just really digging the the mascot platformer 3D games at the time. Yeah, absolutely. And um, <laughs> I guess we should explain this to Paul. Well, you you've seen it enough. So anybody who's not familiar with Spyro, it's a little purple dragon. Uh, it's a it's a platformer, as as Wolf was just saying. It's a 3D platformer. You run around. You're collecting gems and trying to free these other dragons in the dragon communities that have been turned to stone by the evil, nasty Nork. And uh, that's... I was hoping you were going to say Yeah, basically, you go around burning Aiden. So, yeah, you're this kind of, like, very young, pre-adolescent dragon saving all of these fully grown dragons who each have their own kind of personalities and aesthetics. Uh, So it's, it's very cool. And you travel across, I believe it's five or six different worlds uh, via a hot air balloon, saving these dragons and collecting gems. So you can beat the game by saving a certain number of dragons, collecting a certain number of dragon eggs um, and, you know, gems, or what I always had to do was, you know, hundred percent it, collect everything, save everything and I've always found this to be one of those games, kind of like Mega Man X uh, or those type of games, where I have to 100% it. I have a hard time not doing a completionist run. Do you guys get that with the, with the series? Okay, can you no. expand on that, Posh? <laughs> no. There's another thing for our, our Patreon <laughs> soundboard. Oh, yeah, I I spent (laughs) weeks probably on the first Spyro games originally playing through and finding everything. Like, I I did everything in the first game, and then I moved on to the next game and did everything Mm -hmm. again. And I was going to do that with the remake. I did it all with the first game, and I haven't gone back to play two or three yet on the PS4. So for me in the remake, uh, so before this episode... I was trying to play it with my kids. I actually bought it for my kids a couple of weeks back after watching UGP play it. And I've had a few people tell me this game is great for kids. So I've been trying to go through it. And I actually just had that argument with my, my oldest. She's demanding, demanding that I find every freaking dragon and every damn egg chasing those blue sons of bitches down for their eggs to like 100% the game. She doesn't know, know what 100% means or that there's a second ending. She just wants me to find everything. And I'm just trying to like speed through it to see the bosses for this podcast. She was driving me nuts. Oh, I see. So you were playing through trying to rush through it. And she was like, no, daddy, you got to get it this way. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. like some of those eggs are tough to get, right? And some of the dragons, I got most. I mean, I I think I'm halfway through it. I've beaten three bosses. And I've gotten almost all the dragons. But for the hub worlds especially, because it's a hub world and then the sub worlds are off it. Some of the hub hub worlds I haven't really explored fully to get all the the dragons, and I'm just kind of going through it. Okay, so yeah, let, let me explain a little bit more about the layout of the game for anybody who is uninitiated. Pulse, um, there's as as sick Jake is saying, there's like a hub world. You show up, and within that world, there's I believe each world has six other levels inside of it. So with the hub world, you're going around saving X number of dragons, collecting X number of gems, which the pause screen will tell you how many things you have to do in each world or level, you know, regarding the number number of dragons to save, the number of eggs to collect from the little blue thieves that run away from you, or um, the number of gems to collect. So that's kind of how you know where you are percentage-wise with each, with each stage. <clears throat> and then it's up to you to, to find or uncover... Um, some are very obviously set out. These little these little stone thresholds that you can go through to enter into the, the sub-levels. Um, and some are hidden, where you've, you've got to figure out little puzzles uh, to be able to activate those, which I, I always found to be quite fun. So yeah, that's that's how you advance. And as Jake said, there's, there's bosses. Each world um, seems to have one main boss that's running the show. I have found with this game, the boss fights are never really that difficult. Did, he, uh, did you struggle with that at all? 
Uh, difficult boss fights? Polish? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you're here. <laughs> so for me in the remake, the first boss you come across did not realize it was a boss. And that happened another time as well, too, where I just thought it was another enemy. Uh, the first one especially, I want to say it was the uh, the guy, the pumpkin, Jack Lantern, on his head. Mm -hmm. I had more trouble with the mobs outside the boss area. The the dogs with the wizards were kicking my butt. But the boss itself, I just flew through, and I didn't even realize. And it was the same thing with another one where you flame him a couple times, and he hops between the islands. I didn't even realize it was a boss. So, like, it's definitely in the grand scheme of things. Like, I, I never thought I would play a game with bosses easier than Mario Odyssey, because <laughs> Mario Odyssey has dead simple bosses. Yeah. But Spyro is super easy. Right. Not to say the entire game is easy. There's hard parts, but the bosses were not an issue. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think the, the challenge in the game lies in collecting things and the platforming aspects. Um, you know, so as this little purple dragon, you have access to, like, fire breath, which is just a, a quick little exhale of, of fire that, you know, extends about the length of your body. Um, or you can ram other bad guys, you know, or, or the bosses. And some guys are impervious to being rammed. Giggity, and some uh, are impervious to to fire breath. So you got to kind of figure out how to defeat each thing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But Wolf, how about you in the the boss fights? I, I, before we get into it, I got a question. If it's a That's fart, cool. I'm going to just lose my mind. No, it's <laughs> not yet. Um, <laughs> on a scale of like one to five for difficulty, what would you call it? Is one a difficulty or is five a difficulty? Uh, five is five is most difficult. I honestly, I. Middle of the road, I would say three. Okay. Jake, what about you? Yeah, I'd probably agree with that. The bosses, I mean, again, I haven't beaten the game, but three or four worlds in, bosses are easy, but there's a couple platforming sections mm -hmm. where if you fall, you die instantly. And those were a pain in the butt. So that would keep it at least a three out of five. Okay. And Werewolf? Um, I, I honestly don't remember any of the bosses from Spyro except the last boss. Oh yeah, Captain uh, Anticlimax. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so, well, just one quick then. Uh, out of another scale, just to do it. This one's just for Jake. Uh, one to ten Kirby's. How difficult is this? Oh, you've asked. Me. <laughs> okay. Is it harder than Kirby? Yeah, you know, Kirby on NES is harder. Okay, that's, that's all I wanted to know. Sorry if we're yeah. cutting you off there, GP. Please continue. Yeah, Spyro's not any as hard. I'm glad that you cut me off, and I hope you continue to, because I, I don't want you to just be quiet the whole time because you haven't played the game. That's why I, I make sure to keep asking your opinion on things. No. So you just keep jumping in. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, so, okay, back to you, Werewolf. Um, you said that uh, you don't remember many of the boss fights except for the, the very end one. So, Nasty Nork... The, the big bad of the entire thing. Or as they call him, Ganasty Ganork, because Nasty Nork is spelled with G's. Um, it is a very simple boss fight and underwhelming in that I believe you only have to hit him or f flame him twice. Am I remembering that right? It's like twice, and then he just spits out all of this treasure. And I remember because I just recently played the Reignited trilogy, or at least the first, the original Spyro. Uh, I, I beat him, and I was left, thinking, okay, there's going to be a final form or something. And it was so underwhelming uh, that it really, like, if I had to say that, you know, there's a, a blemish on this game, it's it's the underwhelming climax. What do you guys say? No. I'm looking, I'm, I'm consulting my memories on YouTube now. And uh, <laughs> I'm seeing these boss fights, and man, I don't remember these at all. And I guess it's because most of, like, I remember the sheep one now that I see it. Mm -hmm. but I guess it's because they were a lot of them were chases, and so I guess that didn't really stick with yeah. me as a boss encounter. No, that makes sense. They are very forgettable, but when you have a game that exists where like the, the platforming is, is solid but still a challenge, and there's puzzles and there's things to collect, and each world uh, looks different. Like there's a magic world where the terrain is you know different. There's another like sky world where you're jumping between a bunch of uh, islands floating in the sky, there's, you know, like a, a pasture kind of world or like a desert kind of world. The the boss fights, while they're thematically relevant, uh, are comparatively easy to forget. Yeah, and I 
I don't think that's really to the game's detriment thinking about it because some of the hardest parts of that game are really controlling Spyro while you're dashing along, trying to nail all the platforming maneuvers, avoid obstacles, kill enemies, all that without stopping unhindered. And the boss fights really make you focus on that, it looks like. So to to that end, I think the boss fights probably kind of nailed what the developers were going for for the player experience. But the bosses themselves become forgettable entities in the overall scheme of the game. Yeah, I, they're at zero points in, in the game where I'm like, that was a, a really unique and fascinating boss fight. Yeah, and I think because it's not rewarding to the player in that, you know, it, it's it's expected development instead of acquiring collectibles and secrets and things like that. Because there are times in Spyro where you pull off some really cool stuff and you find a secret and you're like, oh, that was cool. And then you have to do that with a boss fight. And it's like, man, that was annoying. And I think it's because you're being forced into it instead of opting to do it on your own. Well, let me let me counterpoint that and ask Sick Jake this question. Jake, do you think that maybe part of the reason the boss fights are underwhelming is because they are not forced? In fact, I think the only boss fight you have to do is is Nasty Nork at the end because you can always just get onto the hot air balloon provided you've saved enough dragons or collected enough jewels to just move on to the next world without ever going into that level at all. Can you? Wait, you, you don't have to kill the bosses? I don't think so. I, I I could be wrong because again I think I've only ever hundred percented it, but I'm pretty sure you know. No, in fact I'm 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 certain that you can't advance without it because when I just did the reignited one, I had missed Jacques, the uh, the boss fight from like the the swamp world, and I had to go back and and fight him. So you can you can advance through it without the boss fights. I'm pretty sure. Oh wow! Well, it's because I had read I read it from a guy that it's it's something like fifty dragons. 10 eggs or something and 6,000 gems. So I was kind of ballparking that. I, I thought the bosses were required. I didn't realize you didn't need to. That's hilarious. Yeah, I assume uh, they were. It'll save you some time. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you guys assume that because we're all game players. <laughs> like, like it's almost a courtesy to the game. Like, I'm just going to assume I have to do this and we'll move on. But really, if you can skip them, it just becomes another thing that you've done in that game. Like, now I kind of want to go back and see if I can just do the minimal run. Of course, I say that now. If I were to fire the game up tonight and play it, I would not be able to not collect everything because I'm just <laughs> I'm that kind of gamer. Yeah. I'd be the same way. I I just played through the messenger and I felt compelled to do everything and find everything. That was so much fun to watch, by the way, when you did that on Discord. <laughs> that was That was a treat. I've missed watching you. Third creepiest thing I've said today. <laughs> Secret eyes. <laughs> well, we're not trying to get hit with the DMCA or DCMA or whatever. <laughs> Hungry eyes. <laughs> Hungry eyes. I. Well, you said cool doing cool stuff with Spyro, and you're definitely right because I the boss I just beat was blowhard, and that's probably the best level so far I've done. And it wasn't for the boss. It was the lead up to the boss. There's these green wizards in pairs shooting lightning bolts at you. And you really have to, if you rush through it, you you actually have to take advantage of the barrel roll, light one up, roll, light it up, and keep going. And you're killing eight in rapid succession. And it felt amazing. It's an amazing sequence. And then you get to the boss. You blast him once, and he runs off into a cave. And then the cave, you have to do a little bit of platforming. And I died there twice because I'm a scrub. But the, the lead up, where you're killing those eight wizards one after another is just, and, and there's other parts in the game where they kind of combine enemies who are fire immune versus who need to be uh, or bash immune together in very interesting ways, and you do really a lot of cool stuff. Like it's very well designed, uh, like combat areas. Like considering the size of the game, they added a lot of small things, like you know, collecting keys or you know, um, chasing down the the thieves with the eggs. But really, once you get past the first world, you've essentially done all of it, and it's just more of the same in a different-looking area. Would you guys agree with that? Yes. Oh, shit. Okay. (laughs) The difficulty level gets ramped up 
But otherwise, for the most part, yes. Save for... Right. No, yeah, even the flying stuff. That starts in the first world, doesn't it? Yeah, okay, so that's another thing. Of of each world, how they have the six sub-levels, uh, every world is guaranteed to have one stage where all you do is fly. At no point should you land, um, unless it's to just change direction. And in each of these flying things, it is timed. I think you have 60 or, you know, whatever, 70 seconds. And you have to, you know, uh, burn four land or eight lanterns or fly under eight arcs or destroy eight um, airplanes or, you know, just various things that you have to cruise around uh, in this time limit and destroy. And then for everything you destroy, you get one or two or three seconds uh, added to your time. And so that is a, a, a unique and interesting thing. And I think it's you either love or you hate those stages. Compared to the rest of the game, I will say that those were the stages I looked forward to the least. How about you guys? No. <laughs> Every time. So <laughs> I would say I, I couldn't finish them. I tried the three of them, and I couldn't get anywhere in them. I think I got eight archways once, okay. and then the rest I always ran out of time. Do you get any reward for doing them? Uh, don't they give gems or something when you complete everything? I don't know. Yes. I think it's the equivalent of 200 gems per stage. Um, I could be mistaken, but I, I do feel like... Yeah, because when I beat Nasty Nork, I still hadn't gotten all of the gems. And when I went back and I had to find what I was missing, one of the stages I missed was a flying level. And that, yeah. So they do give you gems. And again, I think it's 200. But yeah, essentially when you're doing that, when you're doing the flying timed levels, it is trying to uh, figure out the order in which is most optimal. So yeah, I mean, they are very tough, and it's trial and error, but essentially you should never have to double back or fly around the stage more than once. So it's really just trying to figure out, okay, what is the pathway of these moving items? Where are the stationary items at? And what is the most effective route? Uh, to to take to do that. What, what what say you, Wolf? What do you think about those flying stages? I didn't hate them. I I actually kind of liked that they gave a break to the other gameplay mechanics and switched it up for a little bit. Uh sometimes I did feel it could be frustratingly difficult, just because again, since it wasn't the main form of gameplay mechanics, it was ascent. It was always going to be a little bit harder going into those levels, especially as their difficulty got ramped up, because that's not what the main gameplay was like. Right. Yeah, it was, it was a departure from that, yeah. The, so the departure was welcome, but the difficulty scaling was perhaps a little bit unforgiving. Okay. Just because that wasn't what you were always doing. So every time you came across it, it was quite a bit harder than the last time, and since that's not what you were spending the last three hours doing, probably your, your brain just isn't wired for it at the moment when you get there. So you end up probably spending about twice as long as you would, which extends the gameplay a bit, of course, but you probably spend about twice as long as on the level as you would have, if the whole game played that way. So which level then in Spyro would you say is the equivalent to the sun and the moon boss? I okay. I guess before I answer that, let me counter ask: What is Sun and Moon? Well, the Sun and Moon boss from Kirby. Okay, I thought we were making Pokemon references, and I'm not going to get the Pokemon. <laughs> no, no, sorry. No, you're you're fine. Is there a Pokemon Sun and Moon, or am I just stupid? There is. Yeah, there is. <laughs> okay, is that one of the bosses from Animal Crossing? What's what's a Kirby? <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> it's an enemy in Link's Awakening, okay? Oh, I love Zeldor. Uh, no, I... That's my joke. Okay, I'm so sorry. Go ahead, Paul. It's Zeldor. There you go. Um, I got a question for you guys since we're talking about the gems that you're collecting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and is that something that goes through all the games? Or is it just like the original three? I don't know. Um, I'll let the other guys answer. But I, I personally, I've only played the first one. Um, I'll let the other guys answer that, and then I'll I'll continue where I'm at. So, yeah, if you guys know the answer to that, go ahead. I I want to say gem collection is present in all of them. Okay. I want it. I 
Definitely the second one. I saw a trailer. I feel like I remember. I know it's in the original trilogy. I feel like it was also in the GBA game that I saw my brother play. So that would lead me to believe it's their, the coins of Spyro, you know, the Mario coins of Spyro, just with a collection limit. Okay. And so with the original, like, trilogy and the the reignited trilogy, do they adjust for inflation? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was something like an extra 2,000 gems in the reignited trilogy from the original Oh, game, that, so... that totally counts, man. There that you counts. Go. Yeah. They got a bailout. <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would say, going back to your question, Jake, about Sun and Moon, probably, I, I, I wouldn't, equate any one stage to that but there was a certain i i guess you'd call it mission or sub quest to the game that was stupid hard and i probably spent way too long trying to accomplish it and i'm sure a lot of people did is flying around the ice level now this isn't a flying level but one segment of it you do have to fly and do loops around an ice cave and I think you're trying to smack a bad guy or a few bad guys and collect something as you go around the loop. And you don't want to go in the water, you don't want to hit the walls, or you land, and it messes with your timing and all that. So trying to accomplish that was ridiculously hard for me, and I actually had a friend trying to get the achievement for it, and she spent, I want to say, days on that. Wow. So, so there there are hard things, but they're not required like those those achievements. Yeah, but that was one of the actual like there you actually got gems and whatever other collectibles out of it from doing it normally. It's just the achievement I think came with adding an additional tier of difficulty to it for personal challenge. Yeah, bragging rights. So you get no rewards for doing the, they're called secret points I think in this. You don't get any rewards for doing them. The secret points are their own rewards. Yeah. I like it doesn't count toward a percentage or anything like that that is no. built into the game or anything like that. No, it's just a thing that you can do. It's another Okay. So like S- Steam achievements. Yeah. yeah, sort of, but it's also like its own additional collectathon that doesn't count towards the game's progress counter. So where I was gonna go after the uh inflation jokes was about it was another comparison of Spyro to Metroid Prime. Uh in that <laughs> when it comes to the trilogy, I like the first one so much that I always wanted to try the sequels 2 and 3, but every time I start them up, I end up just resenting that the game is not the original and then I just go back and play the original. Uh so I I really do want to sit down and play Spyro 2 as I have not done more than like 5 minutes and that was only to show my four-year-old son, he wanted to see the, the second one, so I showed him that. And then he ran off to go do something else. I'm like, well, fuck it. I guess I'll just go back and play the first one again. <laughs> so in, in that way, it is for me just like Metroid Prime. Every time I start Metroid Prime 2, I'm like, man, I really miss Metroid Prime 1. I guess I'll play that. In your defense, that's partly because it's Metroid Prime 2. See, I don't know enough about it, though, to, to steal on it. Now, I will say this. In my uh, research for tonight's podcast... I found that the critical ratings for the original trilogy, each installment got a higher percentage than the one before, a higher ranking. So, like, Spyro 1, I think, was at, like, 89 or 90 percent, you know, critical rating. And then Spyro 2 came out, and it was at, like, 92, 93. And then Spyro 3 came out, and uh, it was just a bunch of orgasm noises. So, <laughs> Women I'm playing assuming... tennis. <laughs> well... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've never heard that reference before, and I think that's great, and I'm going to keep using it. <laughs> it's, it. There's a story I heard once, and it, it involved that, and then Kid's mom thought it was him watching porn. <laughs> but it was, it was women's tennis? Yes. There's something, I can use that in some way. <laughs> uh, hold on. I have to Google Kevin Federer. You know, I'll do it after the show. <laughs> <laughs> let's avoid those dmca <laughs> right yeah so um another thing i i found out i think i knew this 
but I think I used the wrong name, but I think the thought was correct. The soundtrack for Spyro, which I've always thought was incredibly fitting um, for the game, was done by Stuart Copeland, who was the drummer for The Police. If you guys listen to Sting and The Police, I was an 80s band that was fantastic. And uh, yeah, so Stuart Copeland had done the soundtrack, I believe, for, in fact, the first four Spyro uh, stories. And then a, a, a different person took over after that. But his work with the Spyro uh, trilogy and I guess the fourth one uh, is pretty, pretty damn, pretty damn awesome. It's kind of like Phil Collins when he did the soundtrack for Tarzan. He didn't have to go that hard, but he did. And it was magical. Same thing with Stuart Copeland. Well, OK, so what's weird about that is I'm all for, you know, great musicians doing video game soundtracks. Yeah. Like I think it was Trent Reznor did Doom or something, didn't he? Oh, that sounds no. familiar. Trent Reznor had to have done I something because so. I feel like I feel like I've heard his name attached to a video game before. But I think I think it was something along those lines. And then the the Police is a great band, right? I love mm-hmm. Sting. And but then to do Spyro, really Spyro. <laughs> well, but here's here's <laughs> that seems like a weird game. I don't know. Man. The reason I I I think it's so fitting is the music is so incredibly like all encompassing and ambient. It's not like, okay, if, if you look at a, the original Mario, uh, or really any of the Mario games, you have this music that is pleasant, but kind of jarring. Like, if you look at the setting of, you know, the original Mario, and then you hear the music, you think, okay, that that's not what that world would sound like, I guess. It's kind of weird. But if you look at Spyro, I it, it seems to me like that that world would actually just sound that way. I don't know if that makes sense, what I'm trying to say, but... It's incredibly ambient, and he wrote it to fit the aesthetic and the feel of each world, and I don't know, it was was perfect. It's not as, I don't want to say obnoxious, but as bright and cheery as, you know, do, 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 you know, that's me singing Mario, but it's, uh, it's, it's mood music, and it's fucking brilliant. What do you say, Wolf? It was nothing that, there, there were no tunes that get stuck in my head, but it all fit the game perfectly fit the tone perfectly it got you like it it wasn't annoying it didn't feel out of place and while you're playing it was fun to listen to yeah so they weren't earworms but they were really good really fun really bouncy properly toned music pieces yeah i would agree with that for sure i think it's something that doesn't stick in your head for sure but it was just there ambient ambient spot on exactly what you expect ps1 era platform game music to sound like and (laughs) i i don't mean that as a slight because that for whatever reason like crash bandicoot had that same sort of sound to me even croc had that sort of sound to me and i don't know it's just something about that era all those games they had a similar game feel they had a similar soundtrack feel all of it and it was probably to their benefit because it made people associate those with PlayStation. And, you know, now children have grown up with those and they're, they look back on them fondly like, Oh yeah, that's my childhood. Yeah. Much like, much like we do with Mario one through three, you know? Right. Well, but again, with Mario one through three, if, if you were to say, Hey, what's, how's the music to Mario two go? I could tell you, but I, I spent, you know, 15 years not really thinking at all about Spyro the Dragon music. You know, if people were talking about Spyro, I'd be like, God, I love that game. But the moment I, I turned on the Reignited trilogy, I was like, that's that jam. That's that Spyro music. You know what I mean? But like you said, there's no earworms. It's nothing you're going to be like, the OST for this is dope. You know, it's fire. It's great for what it is. And in that way, it's kind of, forgive me, Jake, like Donkey Kong Country. Well, actually, the music in that is yeah. good. Yeah, and but That's it fits the, the stages, is, is what I'm saying. Um, imagine it's yeah. it's the elevator music of the video game world, uh, it, but only <laughs> only if given that after the long elevator ride, you step out of that elevator saying, that was great. I mean, some kids in class get a C plus, and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you totally made me think of earthworm jim when you said elevator music because i'm like and i'm just like oh it was just so satisfying yeah just on a tangent too if anybody was curious especially if anybody's listening uh the trent Reznor thing was actually for not for doom 
He was a fan of Doom, and it was Quake. Quake. Oh, so okay. he did he did All the right. music and like ambient sound effects apparently, and he attributed it to his love for Doom because he really liked that. And the nail gun ammo box in the game. This is one thing I do remember, and it's not totally from the Wikipedia that, but <laughs> yeah, it had the nine inch nails logo on there. So I just thought that was a cool little tidbit. Now the the nail box he's talking about was not in Spyro. No, no. This this was another game. Yeah, Quake. Yes. Which I just found out I've been pronouncing that name incorrectly all this time. So that's yeah. Yeah, you've been calling it Doom. <laughs> I thought it was Wolfenstein. <laughs> Actually, I, if I remember right, also Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, his writing partner, um, will be doing the remake uh, soundtrack for Kirby. So that'll be dope. Nice. <laughs> that'll be lit. <laughs> that's gonna be that's gonna be very ominous. I'm a big, I'm a big. Well, a lot of new power ups in that Kirby, like the Fruits <laughs> Fiction one. Now, have you guys seen? This is completely off. And if you want to take this out later, that's fine. Have you guys seen the uh, Star Wars um, action sequences, the lightsaber battles? But every time the lightsabers hit, it's like uh, Michael Jackson ism, <laughs> like the hee-hees and stuff like that. No. Yep. Okay, I want no. somebody. If you're out there listening, <laughs> redo that, but use Trent Reznor, uh, Trent Reznor voice. And, and things that would be that'd be the funniest shit so instead of like lightsabers you know clanking and fuzzing on each other you just hear like <laughs> i'm not even gonna do Ang- Trent Reznor, something never. angry yeah. every day <laughs> <laughs> terrible lie <laughs> all right i'm sorry we back to the show so Spyro was done. I want to uh, feel you from the end. Uh-oh. Yeah. Right. I'll stop there. Yeah, no, that's a great song. Anyway. So yeah, Stuart Copeland did that. Um, of course, the, the Tarzan parallel I made was because, uh, of course, Phil Collins famously is, is a, a drummer. And uh, myself, a little bit, am a drummer as well. And so not having the mindset to be able to write anything like what they do, uh, I have tremendous amounts of respect. For, for both the artists, but yeah, Spyro, the 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 ambient music, the the level no, um, music, is almost like a character unto itself, like a supporting character for the level. If that makes sense, it would be a shame to to mute it and listen to something else. I guess is what I'm saying. I would agree with that. There you go. Also, Paul, somehow I can smell that one. Damn it, dude. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, I don't know what's going on, but I'm gonna blame the sausages earlier. <sighs> God. So, what other points have I missed with uh, with at least the original Spyro? What what am I glossing over? Well, I mean, for one thing, the thing that drew me to the remastered or the reignited trilogy was the graphics. Like from the moment you start that game up, it's just it's some of the best I've seen on the Switch. It's up there with Mario Odyssey in quality. And what really stands out to me is when you find those dragons. As far as I can tell. Each one you find is unique in the way they look. Yes. Like custom textures, models. They put so much and different voices for each of those dragons. And you only talk to them for five seconds. Yep. But there's so many of them. Like the amount of time they spent modeling each of those dragons to me is crazy. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. Me. And I think that's, that's something like this, obviously, they did to make money. But it's also very much a passion project. And I think that comes through in those kind of details. You know, you're you're exactly right. You know, they all have their names and they all have their own character designs and, and even different uh, dialects depending on what world you're in, which is very unique. It's crazy. And from when I read the, because um, the remaster wasn't done by, uh, is it Insomniac who did the original? It was done by Toys for Bob. And they had to start from scratch. I think they had a little bit of guidance from the original developers, but they didn't have the original code. And all the to- all the graphics, all the assets were made from scratch. It might as well have been a brand new game, honestly, for the work that they did. And knowing that for the remaster, they rebuilt each of those new unique dragons is mind blowing to me. It looks amazing. For, d- 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 despite what you just said, I will say, when doing remasters like this, and I'm about to shame Nintendo here, I feel like they redistributed resources to give the game more character, since they didn't have to put resources into the design of the game. Right, they already had the game, so they could focus on yeah. The original game is their blueprint. They already know how everything should look, just prettier. They already know how everything should play. They already know how 
all the mechanics work. They just have to re-implement it. They have to rebuild it. Yeah, there was a, there's a lot less legwork had to be done, and they did it for three games, which is super impressive. You know, they they did this with the dragons, like you said. That's a lot of man hours put into modeling individual dragons for all the games. Like that's crazy. Not only that, though, they I think the game was forty bucks new when it first released. Yeah. It was not a full price game. Oh wow. For three of them in a bundle. I mean, that was amazing. And then you compare it to Link's Awakening for the Switch. <laughs> yeah, it was a Game Boy game. But again, you know, it they already have the whole game built. They just have to redevelop it in a new engine. They don't have to come up with how the game works. And that one was a much smaller game than any individual Spyro game. <laughs> and they released it at 60 bucks. Mm -hmm. So to me, Spyro was a labor of love that also made money. Whereas remakes like Link's Awakening are cash grabs. Ooh. Shots fired. Ooh. I agree I, though. I, I was actually, I was disappointed. I, I think Link's Awakening should have had the Oracle games packaged in with it because the Oracle games played exactly the same. If they were going to charge sixty bucks, it should have been three the three GB uh, the three Game Boy games. Yeah, I agree with that. The part that, like I love Link's Awakening, and I do like that remake, but I didn't sixty dollar like it. <laughs> and what bugs me is that performance wise, it runs like crap. Link's Awakening and Spyro is not without its hitches. So there's a few parts where it dips frame rate, but by and large, that game looks better and plays better than Link's Awakening, and it's packed with three games of content. I, I can't speak to the quali uh, the dip in frame rates or anything, because on the PS4, I, I mean, I was playing on a PS4 Pro, which, I mean, admittedly, it's it's not a gaming PC, but as the consoles go, I'm pretty sure it's the most powerful on the market at the moment. I don't know if the Xbox One is more powerful, but PS4 Pro is pretty up there as far as home consoles go. And I didn't, ha I didn't run into any noticeable frame skips or drops or anything like that when i played it heard yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh and now paul should have asked uh who owns the game i'm not sure where the rights are now but when it first came yeah, who, out it was a uh, universal it, property wow yeah okay. they they had their universal you know gaming division that you know went you know belly up or whatever but uh yeah at its at its creation was was universal and in fact, we, we just released an episode that uh, Sick Jake and I had done about Disney uh, games, and I'd made the comment in there that I always felt like Spyro would have been a great addition to the Disney portfolio, especially in, in regards to like their theme parks. Because if you've ever played Spyro, can you imagine how great that would be to see a like a physical manifestation of that game? And it, it plays and looks and has the character. Uh, caricatures or the you know the character features or something that Disney would have, and it's warm and beautiful and, and fuzzy. Yeah, that's actually something I was going to mention because I remember seeing the demo and stuff when I was a kid, and I was just like convinced it was actually a Disney game. I thought completely that it was like a Disney movie that was about to come out or something, and they put a game out to kind of like hype it up, right? And like, I never played it, but I was always looking for that Disney movie. And I think they, they nailed it from what I've seen of people playing it. I've never, I never played it myself, but I like the ones that I've seen play it were fans of the originals. And it seems like a very, very true to, uh, true to the original kind of thing. Like it, it feels like it's honoring the, the original, improving it, but not changing it. Mm -hmm. So I think this will this will appeal to fans that uh, are upset by Final Fantasy remake uh, for seven remake, you know, because they changed it. So if they want something, they want the same but in like better graphics and better yeah. sound. This is this is the kind of thing that they're looking for, and I think that's what that's what's appealing about the Spyro game, the the reignited one for me is that it's like you know let, we we don't need to mess with it it's it's really cool as is so let's let's stick with it it was very optimized for what it was back then and yeah you're right i mean to say it aged well graphically would not be accurate but to say that the game itself is timeless i i think absolutely yes you know probably 3 or 4 systems from now 
they could do the same thing again and and bring it up to par with whatever the gaming world will, will look like in 20 30 years and it will still be relevant well is that and it makes me think of like ducktales you know when they re-released Ooh. ducktales <laughs> yeah thank you uh <laughs> Very half-assed, but thank you. Um, <laughs> no, it, I I just love it when they do that with old games, and they just basically give it the the spit and polish kind of deal because there's nothing wrong with the old games, but you know the graphics sometimes can be a turn off for a lot of people. A lot of people don't enjoy playing on retro consoles or don't have access to it, right. and it gives you this whole new audience. So, like Jake, you said your kids are loving Spyro. They weren't around when the originals were out, right? So it's kind of cool how it exposes a whole new generation to something that, you know, for if your parents like Jake and that, it's it's it's, it's kind of cool. It's like, you know, it's a it's a bonding experience, I'm sure. So here's here's the problem with this. Yeah. Especially when they tell you, get it all. <laughs> well, exactly that. So here's the thing. So they saw GP playing Spyro. That's what kicked us off and well I spent the money to buy the game and then they realized on Netflix they recognized the purple dragon from the Skylanders show and I guess it's the same studio owns the rights to to, I think it's Crash Spyro and Skylanders I think I don't know about Crash but Activision owns the other two now yes yeah okay so in the show Spyro is a guest in this the Skylanders universe or whatever so my kids love the character and they love Skylanders now. And they've been asking me the last two days, we have the Spyro game. Can we get Skylanders? And I was looking into that. And then, boy, man, is that a clusterfuck? I don't want to go down. <laughs> all the collectible toys. I was looking at the eBay prices. Because the game, the last one didn't do as well as they wanted to. So they kind of canned the idea of toys integrating into games. So the, But there was a Switch version three years ago. And it's like 120 bucks on eBay. And you can't download it from the eShop. It's nuts, but it has Spyro too. So like it's it's a brand that's definitely reached out. The the cartoon Skylanders cameo, and then on its own with the reignited. It's a, it's a really solid character in, in IP. And when I look at all the first gen 3D platformers, Spyro is probably one of the higher up ones in the list. I I almost rank it. I'm trying to think if it's better than Mario 64 or not. Nine I'm leaning toward maybe. <laughs> Oh, how many Kirby's? <laughs> Not difficulty, just you know, a scale. Of Mario sixty four is harder than Kirby. I would sure. personally say I enjoyed Spyro more than Mario sixty four. I've played both oh. of them through a hundred percent, both back then and more recently. And I find a lot of frustration with Mario sixty four that I don't find with Spyro. Uh, I I think variation of worlds. I've got to give it to Mario sixty four. But the ability to have a game mechanic add tedium, you know what I mean? Like, they, they, they really both games are just the same thing over and over, but in different landscapes. Spyro did that part better. For as big as Spyro is and as simplistic as the goals are, it never seems to get old. Whereas there is, I think, a certain part with Mario 64 where it's like, I don't want to do Wet Dry World. That stage sucks. Whereas, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah, Spyro could have, honestly, I think every world has six stages. They probably could have taken one out of each. I, there's probably one stage out of each world where I'm like, that's my least favorite. But none of them are a hassle. None of them are a dread. Where you're like, I hate this part of the game. Whereas I think with 64, you definitely have that. So I, I, it, oh, you got me by the short ones. I don't know if I could pick between the two. But uh, interesting. I never thought to compare those two. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> well you know it makes sense with mario 64 why you didn't like it why it felt a bit more of a grind is because you're forced to go back into every level for more stars and they they kind of remix the level for the new stars but you're right it's to 100 percent mario is sometimes quite grindy and tedious and you're right there are some worlds where you just can't bear to go back into it again but spyro you're always facing a new new world new environment and overall, it's shorter than Mario, but it's it also feels faster paced, and you don't really have to explore unless you really want to, right? Like, I feel like this is a game that'd be a fantastic speedrun watch. I actually should do that after this this episode. I want to see what the speedrun looks like for Spyro. I bet it's a blast to and watch. Both games, I would say, are, are neck and neck when it comes to frustration level. If you have 
<laughs> 99 coins and you're only missing like one gem to get that 100%. Because at some point you've done this giant landscape and you're missing one gem or you're missing one coin and you're like, where the fuck do I have to go for this? <laughs> so, you know, that's really only an issue if you're trying to 100% everything. But both games ultimately very rewarding. Also, Mario 64 has the better boss battles. Well, they're memorable. Yeah. But then it's only the same boss battle repeated three times, right? Yeah, that's fair too. But even so, the the one bad guy that you have to fight, you know, Bowser over and over, uh, still infinitely more interesting than any of the stuff that Spyro throws at you uh, villain-wise. Yeah. But yeah, so that's, you know, it's an interesting debate. I think that in and of itself could be its own episode. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I will say this also. We were talking about character design for Spyro. Spyro is this incredibly, like, charming child of a dragon. Uh, if he were to be a Disney character, he would likely be the Disney character that the other Disney character's parents would have been like, maybe don't hang out with Spyro. Because he, he's got a little <laughs> bit of an edge, a little bit of an attitude, and he's a bit of a cocky little shit, which is great. Um, if you're somebody like me who is a cocky little shit. So uh, there's something about him where he's just so gung-ho, and he's like, yeah, don't worry about it, guys. Uh, I got this. I'm going to go save the day. And he's he's kind of fun and charming. And, and the character's design, especially in the update, the remaster, uh, they just nailed his look and his voice and everything was just spot on. I love As a character, he's fantastic. So for Spyro, I ended up watching the ending on YouTube just so we could, because we're doing this episode about the podcast. And uh, Spoilers! Yeah, his attitude is definitely there in the ending too, which is not a great ending, but it's kind of like you kill the boss and you come back and the narrator's like, oh, so did you do it, Spyro? Yeah, yeah, well, I killed uh, I killed Nasty there, or Gnasty, what the hell's name is. But uh, yeah, I didn't get all the eggs or something. Oh, well, Spyro, you better go back and do that. And then if you 120% the damn game and come back, suddenly he's wearing, like, sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a lot more cool about it. But it's still very much like the attitude, like, ah, no big deal. I took him down. I'm Spyro, bitch. <laughs> Think about what they're trying to teach kids who, who are playing this. Uh, be thorough and do a good job and do what is right, but don't do it for the big thanks. Just do it because it's the right thing. Just do it all because you're Spyro, bitch. Well, when Spyro was initially conceptualized, I think, he was very just 90s attitude. You know, much like Sonic. But then with subsequent games, with subsequent games, they toned down his... I guess you'd Sassafras. say his attitude, you know, Sassafras. his because <laughs> they they wanted him to be a little bit more kid friendly, I guess. Yeah. So I think that's why with the hundred twenty percent, he doesn't seem as snarky. I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm older. I like the snark. I did too, but it it was just yeah. you know where they went with the Sassafras. character in subsequent games, and so I think when they did that, they were like, well, we should make it more in line with. The other games than the first one, <laughs> right? Well, and then I, I I think it's it's almost not hilarious, but slightly under hilarious. We'll say mildly funny when he saves like an an elder dragon or like an ancient kind of dragon, and he's like, "Oh, thank you, Spyro," and then he starts to Im imbue some like wisdom, and Spyro's like, "I should go," <laughs> 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 or like you know he lets him finish the sentence, and you know all he says is okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very much the equivalent of an okay boomer. Oh god, yeah. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just goes to show there's a purple dragon shoves into all of us. <laughs> Not since college. And with that, I want to say thank you to everybody who's been listening. <laughs> Guys, uh, I think we should wrap up the episode. Unless again there's there's something you want to say, in which case save it until I say your name. But uh, we're, we're, we're closing in on <laughs> one year of Press B to Cancel and uh, 30, however many episodes we're at now. And I just want to say to my friends, Palsh and Sick Jake and Werewolf, I have loved doing this with you guys. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, the next year. Oh, dude, I thought you were about to say, uh, peace, I'm out, fuck you all. I mean, I can, but <laughs> I, I would much rather. Yeah, no, don't, don't. <laughs> and then the mic drop. Yeah. I, <laughs> I'm not my uncle. I don't know why why would I say that? <laughs> but is somebody in a hurricane? What's going on? I'm getting I, some I dropped the mic. 
Oh. And then oh, I had to put it a, away. A mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> that is the least baller shit that you can do is drop the mic and then be like, I am so sorry. Let me pick that up. <laughs> anyway, guys, I, uh, no. That's Pirelli, a Katie wedding right it's, there. It's been a lot of fun so far. And uh, yeah. And for everybody listening, just know we're starting to just now finally find our rhythm. And we've still got a lot of great topics to discuss. So keep tuning in and telling your friends about it. So that's all I'll, I'll say about that. Uh, so that's been Spyro Werewolf. If you have any final thoughts on Spyro, feel free to talk about it now and tell everybody where they can find you. I feel like Spyro was a great introduction to where Insomniac was headed in the future, looking at their uh, their game catalog. Because they went on to make the Ratchet and Clank games, mm-hmm. and then the recent Spider-Man game. So yeah. clearly the guys at Insomniac really know what they're doing. Yes. Except for maybe Sunset Overdrive, but I didn't play that one, so I can't judge it for myself. I want if I, if they're listening, I want a VR experience of Spyro. I want to be able to like glide around in these worlds in VR. Would you guys play that a VR Spyro? I don't have a VR, so I wouldn't. But I I don't either. <laughs> but I'd still play the fuck out of it. I mean, like... <laughs> probably not. I'd probably get it. Probably get ah, I wouldn't sick. get sick. <laughs> I'd have a lot of fun with it. Probably. Uh, well. Even if it was an abbreviated version and it was just the flying stages from each world, that would be cool. This is true. That could be fun. So, Jake, uh, any final thoughts? I'm sorry, Werewolf, I didn't mean to cut you off. I could be found on Twitter and here. (laughs) There you go. Uh, Okay. That's that Spyro talk. And that's that's Werewolf. Is that typical spelling or how would we spell that? No, it's it's spelled somewhat unusually. W-A-R-E-W-U-L-F-F. Wonderful. I love you. And uh, Sick Jake, final thoughts? Yeah, and I'm Sick Jake. You can find me on Twitch and Twitter. And also, I'm doing a couple of runs for charity, COVID relief uh, for United Way over on twitch.tv slash Zelda done whatever. And no, that's what it's called. Not a joke. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to need you to tone down your excitement there, Sick Jake. (laughs) Uh, No, I love that you're doing the charity stuff. And and of course, with everything happening in the world with the COVID stuff, then... That's that's wonderful. I think uh, I think you're doing good work. And uh, Paul Schwan or nine, any final thoughts on Spyro or uh, any of that? And where can where can people find you? No. <laughs> Paul Schwan on nine <laughs> at hotmail <laughs> no, at hotmail uh, dot fart at hotmail dot fart at hotfart dot com. Oh God. Um. Look. Okay. I had a lot to eat. <laughs> um. No, I. I want to play it. If I had a PS4, I would be going straight for the Reignited Trilogy, to be honest. It it looks fun. It's on it's... PC. Is it seriously? Yeah. It's on Steam. I thought they were waiting a whole other year for Steam to happen. They did. No. Oh, I'm thinking of Final <laughs> Fantasy. And you're right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Paul. All right. Get with it. So I got some research to do, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> you can find me here. Thank you. Uh, I'm known to stream on Twitch occasionally at P A L S H one oh nine. So it's twitch.tv slash polish one oh nine. Very, very good. And uh, as always, my name is Guy Prime from the Therapy Couch. You can find me as the Therapy Couch on twitch.tv slash the Therapy Couch. Yes, I'm I'm getting paid every time I say that. Or you can find me on YouTube uh under the Retro Therapy. Or uh I think the Retro Therapy is also on Instagram. And then you can find me as either the Retro Therapy or the therapy couch on Twitter. <laughs> this is way too confusing. Can you just go back to the retro therapy? For I me? tried. I they won't please. let me. They won't let me. Oh, I thought after fuck. two months I could go back to it. Well, you can change your name after two months, but you have to wait six months for the original name to come back. Oh, no. Wow. Oh, fuck. Can you put in a ticket? Yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to have to do that. But yeah, so anyway, you can find me on twitch.tv slash the therapy couch on Twitter as the therapy. Okay, I'm not doing the whole thing again. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody thank you for being here yeah and uh go play spyro if you haven't played it it's on steam spyro bitch <laughs> it's... <laughs> yeah. i just want the last thing anybody hears to be i'm spyro bitch and that's and going I'll on the put... soundboard yeah and then i'll put the <laughs> give me more by britney spears in there <laughs> <laughs> yeah Thank you for watching this week's episode. Hit subscribe and that bell to be notified of all our future videos. 
for audio versions of our podcast, please check out Apple or Google Podcasts, Spotify and Stitcher, or anywhere else you like to listen to your favorite shows. As well, feel free to visit our website at breastfeedtocancel.com.